January is Cervical Health Awareness Month. So I'm here with OBGYN, Dr. Jessica Shepard, to talk about the importance of cervical health and preventive screenings. Dr. Shepard, great to see you. Good to see you too, Katie. So let's first of all talk about what the cervix is. It may sound like a dumb question, but I think a lot of women are confused. So the cervix is a very critical part of our reproductive system, but if I usually like to put it in context of a light bulb. If you think of a light bulb, that lower portion of the light bulb is what I would say is the cervix. The and silver? The silver part is going to be the cervix, and the bulb would be what we would say is like the uterus. So it's the lower part of the uterus and the top part of the vaginal canal. So in many ways, it's like the gateway it to is. the rest of your reproductive system. Absolutely, and I think that women get confused with where it is and what it is, but it's a very important part of everything. Let's talk about cervical cancer. How big a problem is it, Dr. Shepard? Now, cervical cancer, when we think of back maybe in the 70s, was the leading cause of cancer death in women. And so now that we have had the PAP as a screening tool, we really have seen a decrease in numbers of cervical cancer deaths. And this is why it's so important to have these conversations and to understand why cervical cancer screening is so important. Now, the rates of cervical cancer are 14,000 new cases a year, and 4,000 plus women are dying from cervical cancer a year. Now, we have seen a decrease in these numbers significantly because we have the pap test, which has become our screening tool, but we have to stay vigilant in order to keep these numbers low. It's hard to talk about cervical cancer without talking about HPV. Mm -hmm. What exactly is HPV? Now, human papillomavirus, HPV, is a virus. And we know that there are many viruses that we encounter as humans, but HPV is one that is the leading cause of cervical cancer. So when we look at cervical cancer rates, up to 90% or more are caused by HPV. And it is sexually transmitted, but this is a virus that most people are exposed to. So when you do have a diagnosis or you do get a screening of HPV that is positive on your testing, you are not in the minority, you're actually in the majority. What are some of the screening guidelines, Dr. Shepard, for detecting and preventing cervical cancer? The most important part that you just featured was preventing cervical cancer. And this is why the pap test and HPV testing is so crucial. Now, when we think of pap testing, there have been a few changes in guidelines over the last few decades, but where we are right now is starting at the age of 21. And 21 through 29 is when we have the pap test every three years. Now, the caveat to that is making sure that you get it every three years as your screening test, but having a dialogue with your doctor to ensure that if there are any abnormalities on the pap test, that you talk to them to see if there's any screening or retesting that needs to be done within those three years. Now, after the age of 29, 30 through 65, 65 is when we stop cervical cancer screening, that's when we have HPV plus the pap test. We use that as co-testing together. Starting at age 30. At age 30 to be more effective with how we as clinicians can guide women through what they would need to do to prevent cervical cancer. HPV is incredibly common, isn't very, it? Very, very common. I read that something like at any given time, a huge percentage of women have HPV and it normally just leaves your system, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's, you know, with all viruses, they have the ability to stay or go away. I kind of say it's either hiding or it likes to come out and play. And with HPV specifically, what we see is that with age, we see more recurrence and we start to see that it persists more. So that's why when we have the guidelines between the ages of 21 through 29, when women are a little bit younger, they have the ability with their strong immune systems and with their young age to regress. And I guess you could say that they make HPV go away. Can you tell us what's happening when you actually do a pap test and an HPV test? The beautiful thing about all of this is both tests are collected at the same time. So it's two tests collected at one time. And what we do with the speculum is that is the tool that we use to actually visualize the cervix. And once we visualize the cervix, we're able to gather specimen and send it away to give us the results from abnormality of cells for the pap test and HPV exposure. I understand some HPV strains are more concerning than others. 
There are many strains of HPV, but we're really focused on a few subtypes of HPV that we know are high risk and are the most leading cause of cervical cancers. Let's talk about what the pap test shows versus the test for HPV. Now this is where it gets confusing. I hear this all in the exam room when I see women for their annual well woman visit is what is the difference and why do we do them together? What we do know is that the pap plus HPV when we start doing that at the age of 30 is the most effective way for us to get more information to give to the patients on what they should do next. Now the pap test looks specifically at cells on the cervix, and that looks at whether they're normal or abnormal. And then when we look at HPV, it's to look at if someone has exposure or no exposure. So when we put both of those features together, we get a better reading of, are there abnormal cells? Is there exposure to HPV? Or vice versa, no exposure or normal cells. And we put all of that information together as clinicians to give the patient the best guidance on what they should do next or what we can do to prevent cervical cancer. Why do you think we're seeing more cases of cervical cancer in women under the age of 50 right now? I think that when we look at frequency and women not going regularly to get screened, this is why we're starting to see cervical cancer rates increase for women under the age of 50. So women really need to stay on schedule. Absolutely. This is something that should be kind of what they look forward to when they go to their gynecologist. Like, and goody, I yes. get to have a pap test and an HPV <laughs> test. Woo! I know, and having that relationship where they want to go to their healthcare provider in order to have that peace of mind. What we have seen is there have been changes in guidelines that, one, can be confusing for patients and not knowing when to go in for screening. Also not knowing the importance of the PAP plus HPV testing and when to go back to their doctor for other screening. And then for certain communities, when we look at cervical cancer, specifically for black and brown women, is that they have increased rates of cervical cancer, but they also have decreased rates of going back for their screening. They have less resources and less ability to get to the doctor to give them those testing and have those discussions. I know black women are twice as likely to die of cervical cancer than white women. Is that because compliance and access to care? Usually when we see those types of rates and disparities, it really has to do with resources and access to care. And so we know with decreased access to care and resources, you are gonna to start to see those rates increase. And also when they do get diagnosed, most black women are already having an advanced form of cervical cancer, and therefore it is harder to one, prevent, because they already have the disease, but also what's needed in order to, again, treat that disease at such an aggressive and advanced state is much harder. What can we do to address these disparities, not only in cervical cancer, but all kinds of cancer and other illnesses for women of color? These are the discussions that we have, allowing women to, one, feel empowered to go to their gynecologist or their healthcare provider to have the discussion on what do I need to do as an individual to make sure that I'm preventing cervical cancer. And starting these discussions at a young age, you know, really having young women understand the importance of their reproductive system and things that they can do from a young age, whether that's with a vaccine or starting at the age of 21 to get their pap test, this is where we're gonna see the impact and this is how we're gonna prevent cervical cancer. The importance of education and conversation and also where women can go for the access to these testing is key and we have to be able to promote and continue these conversations with these women in these communities. Because there are centers and places women can go to get these tests for little if no cost, right? Even if women don't have insurance, we know that there are organizations and community centers that do offer PAP and sometimes PAP and HPV at little to no cost but we have to provide the information for the women to know that the access is there. And convince women why this is so important. Absolutely. I know that the United States Preventative Service Task Force, which is a panel of independent experts responsible for making recommendations about screening, is currently reviewing guidelines for cervical cancer. What concerns you about the potential change in recommendations for screening for cervical cancer? You know, as a, a woman, a gynecologist, a mother, my concerns really lie with 
what can happen if we move to, say, a single test strategy. And that would mean potentially only doing one of the tests when we think of co-testing. And I think this takes away, one, what we have seen in data that has given us more information as clinicians to help our patients and guide them from decreasing cervical cancer rates. So I think when we have the loss of information, it also takes away from the relationship as a clinician that we have with patients and having that dialogue on why it's so important to have both of these tests together. And we know with the PAP plus HPV, we are able to get information that is going to detect up to 95% of cervical cancers. So my hope would be that the more information we have and the more certainty that I can talk to my patients about what we can do with prevention is much more important than moving a test and taking that out of the equation. Would this impact preventative care coverage for patients in your practice, for example? Absolutely. So for women who have had preventative care coverage for years would have a decrease in resources if this were to be a single test strategy because the PAP would not be covered under the coverage that they had for so many years. Dr. Shepard, given the myriad of benefits for cervical cancer screening, why aren't more women getting screened? More women are not getting screened because the conversation and the education that they have about cervical cancer may not be comprehensive in understanding the importance of using the screening in PAP plus HPV to detect early cervical cancer and prevent cervical cancer. Because like many cancers, it is silent and you don't necessarily know when it's happening inside your body, right? Yeah, cervical cancer in its early stages really doesn't have any specific signs, and that's what the PAP and HPV test can really detect. Now, most women who come in and do have some sort of sign or symptom, that's when it's advanced, and that's when we have less that we can do for those women, and that's why we start to see cervical cancer rates causing deaths is when it's advanced. Can you envision a time, Dr. Shepard, when cervical cancer has been completely eradicated? Absolutely, I firmly believe as a clinician, with the tools that we have with screening, with our PAP and HPV together, that we have the ability to not only screen and treat, but we have the ability to possibly cure cervical cancer. So this is why it is so important to get screened.